thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the authors and their team and everyone who's attending. The world is kind of nuts and people are on the computers for work and school and to get back on your computers to do something social and book related is much appreciated. Um, a bit about Belmont Books. We are an indie in the greater Boston area, which is perfect for discussing Margot Woods Fresh. If you're unfamiliar, it's set at Emerson College, which I attended, Margot attended. So we are so happy to host this event. Um, if you haven't attended a virtual event with us before, it's pretty easy, pretty simple. You will just watch these two authors talk. If you have any questions, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. It looks like two little speech bubbles. Please put all of your questions that you have for Veronica and Margot in that box so Veronica can be sure to see them and won't miss them when it's time for Q&A. And you can just submit them as you think of them. You don't have to wait until we open it up to questions, which will be about quarter of. So feel free to submit them when you got them. Because most things are virtual, we also have a pretty robust uh, event schedule right now. Later this week, I think tomorrow at 6.30, we have this pay our picture book launch called Usha and the Big Digger by Amitha Knight, who is a uh, frequent customer at the store. So it's nice to see her first published book. It's a super cute picture book. And she's like personalizing copies for pretty much anyone who wants them personalized. So that's awesome. And then next week, next Thursday on the 12th, if you're into historical fiction, we have The Showgirl by Nicola Harrison. Uh, a cute Midwestern girl becomes a showgirl in, in, in New York City. Um, I thought it was going to be a literary adaptation of showgirls. With would Elizabeth read Berkeley, if there and are I was any like, acquiring editors in the audience. <laughs> would read that. Um, next Thursday with Fiona Davis. And I think I'm also prepping some stuff for Bookstore Romance Day, which is Saturday. August 21st. So there will be a couple panels to keep an eye out for then. Um, but yeah, I think that is it. I'm going to turn it over to Veronica and to Margo. And I'll be back to say goodbyes. But best of luck, you two. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. I'm good. How are you? I'm Thank good. You. <laughs> Thank you. It's very exciting. I like the fact that these exist together is like blowing my mind right now <laughs> I know I felt like we should start by telling people how we know each other because even though we've talked about this a lot, <laughs> it's like so one of my probably. favorite publishing stories uh second day of work second day of work um they asked me to go down and take photos of this author who had their her second book out and she's gonna be signing a whole bunch so they were like go take pictures and hang out with her <laughs> so she's not bored and I go into this room and it's Veronica and she's signing insurgent. And I didn't even know who you were. And I just immediately started taking pictures and it was super awkward and weird, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but it was the beginning of a wonderful friendship. So. It was the beginning of a very long, my gosh, we've been I know, known you for so long now over like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm pretty excited because you've done this we've done it the other way for me a lot. Uh, I think you've moderated a couple events for me. So I'm really pumped to be on the other end of it for once. Yeah, my <laughs> favorite event I've ever done with you was the one in Chicago. Oh no, it was actually in Boston. It was in Framingham. Um, oh, it was for yeah. Allegiant and it was like I that, that one. auditorium theater thing. That was so awesome. That was, that was a great time. <laughs> Man, what a time. Jeez. <laughs> um, well, I freaking love this book, so uh, I'm really excited for people to read it, and I laughed out loud, which does not happen to me while reading, and by this book, I mean fresh, <laughs> sorry, uh, just to clarify. Um, so do you want to start off by, I think uh, we missed our intros, so maybe we should intro sure. ourselves for people who don't know. Sure. Uh, I could go first. Um, I'm Veronica Roth, and I wrote uh, this book, which I don't have a jacket for right now. I don't have the new one either. It's like, there's a 10 year anniversary one out now. I also wrote this one most recently. Yay. Um, yeah, ooh, thanks. Wow, you came prepared. I've got nothing. I'm staying at my uh, in-laws house right now, so I don't have what I usually have. You're good. But... I've got my whole shelf. <laughs> awesome. Um, but yeah, I write books. That's me. Uh, on to you. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Margot Wood. I am 
I guess I like to call myself a professional book enthusiast because not only did I write this little book fresh um, that is out this week, but I also work in publishing. Uh, I used to work at HarperCollins where I started Epic Reads, which is how I met Veronica. And now I work for a small indie comic book publisher out in Portland, Oregon, um, Oni Press, where we publish like Scott Pilgrim, Rick and Morty. Look at me plugging my <laughs> my work stuff immediately you should. Um, yeah I'm, a, I'm in the marketing department so as you can tell i went to emerson college um i lived in boston for four years um uh, and then i lived in new york for like 10 after that and then now i'm out in, on the west coast and it's a lot of fun <laughs> yeah okay can you um show us the i saw a picture on instagram of the inside of fresh oh the, yeah and papers can you just show us those because it's so cute look at that spilled cup Oh, so there's a spilled cup and then in the back there's a chicken for tender chicken <laughs> oh my god i love that they embrace this uh this slightly inappropriate terminology it's extremely inappropriate there's also a, a chicken on um page 69 oh my god <laughs> which i appreciate and there's no jacket which i also really appreciate i hate jackets i'm sorry if you're a jacket enthusiast but i take mine off all the time i like to have a naked book when i read Same. so yeah i'm with you i don't really i don't love a jacket um like, but yeah so I, oh, oh. yeah it's pretty nice chosen one's hardcover is not bad i'm yeah, not lucky with those um but yeah so why don't you uh tell us what your book's about my book in the short elevator pitch is a queer retelling of Emma set at Emerson College. But what it really is about is like being a freshman and being away from home for the first time and what all of that like chaos entails <laughs> your freshman year because it only happens your freshman year because when you're sophomore, it's already done. You've already like you're used to it. You've been there. You've done that. So your freshman year really is like that unique experience where you're housed with a bunch of other people who are going through the exact same anxieties as you um and you're all together at once and a lot of people also just go really buck wild when they're freshmen and i love <laughs> when people just absolutely lose their shit their freshman year um so i really wanted to capture the essence of losing your shit <laughs> your freshman year of college um yeah so it's a lot of fun <laughs> Yeah, so when I was growing up, I would read like, I think a lot of Judy Bloom, but then also, oh my God, the book I wanted, I kept thinking of when I was reading yours is um, Angus Songs and Full Frontal Snogging. Do you remember that book? Louise Renison. Yes, Amazing yeah. book. Amazing I really book. loved it. And um, I think often the reason I gravitated toward these kinds of books is because I was a really reserved and anxious child who didn't want to go do the stuff, but I wanted to know what the stuff was. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I would find out about, you know, because Judy Bloom taught us all about like how to put on a bra and like what masturbation is, you know, like all that stuff. And it was like I learned about my like body and about romance and about like romantic drama and all that from books. So I was like super pumped that this book exists because I was, I didn't find anything like that about college. Um, yeah, I've so had a like this. <laughs> I've had a few people reach out who are like, so when I was a freshman, I was really reserved and I didn't party at all when I was in college. So reading your book felt like I was living vicariously and I got to experience what it was like for somebody who didn't hold yeah. back their freshman year. And that's always really nice to hear because I always worry that people who like didn't get shit faced all the time their freshman year, I worry that they won't connect <laughs> with Elliot. So it's been really nice to hear these people be like, this was a lot of fun to read about somebody else just like going insane. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I really, I am one of those people. I never partied. I didn't, I went to like one party in college, so I'm the worst, <laughs> but um, I, I loved reading it because I was just like, oh, this is what it was like. Um, but I wonder, I wondered like how much of the story you have in common, like with your college experience. A lot. Um, <laughs> the whole book started from, my own experience. Um, it started with a letter that I wrote to my younger sister when I finished my freshman year. I was at an internship and I was super bored one day. So I like wrote this letter to my little sister and I was like, please don't make these mistakes. And I just like listed all the mistakes that I made. So that's how the story started was like, I took each of those mistakes and made like a scene from them. Um, and then eventually it became a whole novel, but there are, a f there's a fair amount <laughs> 
<laughs> in the book that um, is pulled directly from my own life. Like the fact that, so for her first week at Emerson during your orientation week, they made it, I don't know if they still do this. I hope they, they don't do this anymore, but they made us take a test. They had sent us a copy of the Iliad over the summer, I guess. I didn't read it because I was like, I wasn't going to read the Iliad over the summer break. Like, come on. <laughs> um, but they made us take a test during orientation week. And I had never read the Iliad. So I just straight up bombed my very first academic um, experience in college. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember why. It was maybe a placement test thing. Or I don't really know. I, I've never understood why they made us do that. But like, it was a blue book thing and everything. So I had to like really pull some shit out of my ass to like fill that book out. Cause I was like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell happens in the Iliad. And I was so trying like, to remember when I watched the movie, Troy. Yeah. I, and I was trying to, that's exactly what it, I, cause Troy just come out like the year prior. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to be like, okay. So Brad Pitt was like the hot guy Achilles, right. Or somebody, uh, you know, I couldn't remember anything. So that happened. Um, and then the other, like claim to fame thing that happened to me that's in the book. And one of my favorite scenes is um, there's a scene where Elliot, that's our main character. She uh, joins an auction, a dating auction at the very last minute because somebody dropped out. And so she gets up there and auctions herself off for a date and um, says a very suggestive thing and no one bids on her. And that actually did happen to me. Um, I got up there and I was like trying to be all like hot and sexy and and then nobody bid on me. Um, and it was so embarrassing until um, this guy who ended up being one of the <laughs> writers of uh, Parks and Recreation, actually, um, Harris Whittles, great guy. Oh, he, yeah. he mercy bid on me and he came up to me afterwards. Oh he was God. like, he was like, you needed to be saved. So and I was, he was like, you don't have to go on a date with me. <laughs> I was like, thank you. <laughs> Man, that's like an amazing story. And uh, everything I hear about him is that he was a real sweet guy. He was a very, very sweet guy. Rest in peace, Harris Whittles, but he was a really great guy. So he's gone. Wow, too soon. I can't believe he, he saved you. He did. He totally <laughs> saved me. And of course, I was like, I should have like befriended him afterwards, but I didn't. I was too, I was too like right in the face and just so embarrassed that nobody bid on me. <laughs> See, this is the main difference between us is that you would do that auction and I would never do that auction. Whenever oh I God. presented with an opportunity to embarrass myself, for some reason, I want to do it. I don't know why, but. You're very brave. That's why. Because you're like, uh, yeah, wearing my would be great. <laughs> very dauntless. Oh, yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> I had um, to. Sorry, I had to. We got to. Well, okay, so. At what point did it become like an Emma retelling then? So not until about 30% of the book was done. <laughs> I had these scenes. They weren't really even chapters at that point. They were just a bunch of scenes. Um, I had gotten my agent off of one of those scenes. I sent over, um, it was the scene where she's counting ceiling tiles while somebody is enjoying her lady cave. Um, that was how I got my agent, who we share. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, <laughs> that's the scene that, got, that won her over. I know, I know, I know. I'm like, what does that say about Joe? Um, so I had an agent and I had a bunch of scenes, but I had like no story structure. <laughs> At that point, it was just a bunch of funny shit that, you know, with no architecture around it. And so I put it aside and I started rereading a bunch of old favorites because I was like, I was like, uh, how, how are books structured? Because, you know, I never went to school for writing. I'm a marketing major. I'm not an English major. English was actually my worst subject in high school. So I, I spark notes my way through high school. Um, so if I can do it, you can do it too, kids. Um, and I was just really stuck. So I started reading some old favorites. And like one of the only classics that I actually enjoy is Emma by Jane Austen. And so I reread that. And within 20 pages, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I have a book. I know what I'm going to do because it just, I already had this cast of characters that perfectly fit the cast of characters in Emma. And I had the themes that matched the themes of Emma and like the main character of, you know, Emma and Elliot, they were just so similar um, and had such a, like, I don't know. I, I, Elliot to me just really felt like Emma circa 2021 in college. Um, well, non-pandemic version of college, but it was, it was so it was like that only, it was the first time in my entire life as a writer, which was, you know, only a year old at that point. Um, 
<laughs> that I was like, oh, I know what I'm gonna do. I know exactly where this is going. And so I was like furiously writing everything down on a yellow legal pad. I took a photo. I actually just posted that photo on Instagram. Um, yeah, I but saw that that. Was, yeah. And then like within six months, the book was written and it was like sold right after that. So wow. it was really quick after, uh, after I knew what I was doing. <laughs> but well, it first, to have a structure. You're like, yes. okay, well, this is how the plot works, you know? Yeah. Cause I know, you know, that everybody talks about like, are you plotter or pantser? And I obviously was a pantser. <laughs> but that can only get you so far. Um, so once I started to plot things out, then it just, it was much, much faster. So next time yeah. I write a book, um, I will be making sure I know what the plot is first. <laughs> before someone's, gonna, someone's gonna yell me about this, but I think everyone is eventually a plotter. <laughs> oh, they have to be, you have to be, you have, there's no way that you can't be a plotter. Cause like, even once I knew the plot, I, went back and I, I like to write hand write everything out, like in terms of like, I have to visually see it first. So then I took sure. each character and I had to map out like their story arc and like where they start emotionally and where they end up emotionally and how do you get from point A to point B. And it, like, you have to be able to map all that shit out. Um, so it was actually easier to start from like the end and work my way backwards um, and figure out how to get to the end that I want. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of revisions, but um it was Don't a lot of fun <laughs> yeah yeah did you enjoy it I mean because you you weren't really like that much of a writer before so no, what changed from like wanting to talk about books to wanting to make them that was the whole thing like I never thought that I would enjoy writing because I'm ADHD and like anything that takes longer than like I don't know a day <laughs> I'm bored with immediately so the fact that I when I started writing fresh I was having so much fun writing from Elliot's point of view that the entire writing process for me was like pure joy uh and I really started writing after my dad passed away in 2015 and it became Elliot and this book became my like way of coping with grief because I tend to default to comedy so um it was a way for me to escape from all the <laughs> The sadness that I was experiencing. And it was probably the only thing that like was making me laugh in the last five years um, besides some old favorite TV shows. But yeah, it was, I didn't think that I would enjoy it, but I, I, I remember just like talking to everybody and I was like, I can't believe how much fun this is. I was like, this is what I want to do for my living now. Like, <laughs> sorry, publishing, but like, this is way more fun. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just feel like it's the same activity, you know, like writing is one activity. But it, there's like room for a lot of variation in it. And yes. I think that helps with the ADD brain. My husband has it. So I have some insights into how it works, yes, but not a lot. It is. Especially like I didn't write chronologically either. I started with all the fun scenes first. <laughs> so uh, I, I. Saved for, <laughs> I saved all yeah. the like the tedious parts like for much later down the road during the editing process. But I started with all the fun par parts first. And I also started writing um, every scene was just dialogue because I, I'm not good with like sentence structure and like, you know, all the filler stuff and world building. Um, none of that comes naturally to me, but dialogue does. And so I would just start like literally just furiously writing down dialogue. And then I would go back and like fill things in later. Um, and I think it helps for a book like Fresh, uh, but that is so like, they don't really leave Emerson, <laughs> you know, like yeah. there's only a handful of scenes out in Boston. Um, the majority of it takes place in the one Emerson building, the little building. So it was, I don't know, it was, it was fun. For some reason, it, it, it didn't seem like it took me that long, to be honest. I think once I realized what I was, knew what I was doing, then it was so, it was so much faster, which helps with the ADD brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, once it clicks, it clicks. Like it, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes <laughs> books do that and sometimes they don't. Um, <laughs> but I also, I think that's interesting because like uh, Chosen Ones was my, the sixth novel, I don't, I don't know, but um, that's yeah. why I wrote it. I wrote the dialogue first, each scene, and then I filled in the gaps. So it doesn't even matter like if, how experienced you are or how good you were at English or how much you wrote before, like you find the method that works for the book. And I think so too, it. you know, and like, I just, I studied the books that I liked a lot, you know, there was like a mm -hmm. handful of books that I had really loved like comedy books that I had super, super loved before I even worked in publishing. And those were the ones that were in the back of my head this whole time when I was writing this book. And so I went back and I kept rereading them and I really studied them. And 
like I said, I've never taken a class in writing. Like I watch all these TikTok people about, you know, they're offering writing advice and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I think the best writing advice is just figure out how, like what works for you, because I think that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. but also just studying other books that are out there, read them critically. Okay. <laughs> what were they? Um, lamb, the gospel, according to Biff, Christ's childhood book. pal by Christopher Moore, best book. I love that book. Um, I also loved, um, beat the Reaper by Josh Bazel. He does footnotes in his book. Um, and that footnote idea has been in my head ever since I read that book in like 2009. Um, there is this one called Boomtown. I forget who wrote it, but, um, that was a really funny book. It was just like a lot of comedies. Louise Renison, honestly, like I love her stuff. She's really funny. Libba Bray is another great um, comedy writer. And then I also started, um, I discovered some new favorites. I started reading like um, a lot of like short story collections that are like written by comedians, like stand up comedians and stuff. And I just, I find that those were really, really helpful. Whenever I would get stuck, I would just read. Um, wow, no, thank you over and over and over again and get inspiration. Um, so there were like a lot of those actually. <laughs> I, I'm so like, uh, I'm so focused on trying to be funnier because I think it's really important for books to have humor because that's how people like, especially if you're writing about like traumatic situations, which you, I mean, you are sometimes right. in fresh, but maybe less of the like, I'm in space and I'm about to explode kind of situations that I write about. Um, but people cope with with trauma or with stress by making jokes. And if you can't write those jokes, then your characters are going to feel less human. So exactly. I'm really into like embracing humor. And um, this book is obviously like friggin' funny. Um, so I, I, <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that part just came naturally to you. Did you did you have trouble like striking the balance of it? Because you can't always be you know like you can't completely let loose. You have to like find a balance, I guess. I will say that there's a very, very, very long Google. I wrote the whole thing in Google Docs, <laughs> um, which drives writers crazy. But yeah, that's yes, it does. <laughs> that's all I know. So I um I have a very, very long Google Doc full, full of jokes that did not make fresh, um, wow. because they were too raunchy, um, or they didn't fit into any sort of scene that naturally. <laughs> And I was super bummed about it. Um, but for the most part, sometimes the jokes were hard because I would set myself up, like set it up perfectly, you know, because there is joke structure. It's like the one, two, three punch type of structure um, from the one Emerson college comedy class that I took. Uh, it's like the one thing I took away from that. But so there was a couple of times where I couldn't figure out the punch to it. So I would just leave it blank. And sometimes those things ended up turning into like audience participation in the story. Like there's a part where I couldn't think of something funny to describe a way somebody smells in the book. Cause I wanted to have like two things to describe this person that would be funny, but I couldn't think of anything. So I put in like insert funny scent here. And I ended up just leaving it as that in the book because it made more sense for Elliot to like include participation when she couldn't think of something at the time. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, like the joking definitely came easier. It was a lot harder to put in for me, um, to get the like serious emotional aspect. That was my editorial letter from my editor, Maggie. I love her. Her whole thing was like, Elliot can't just be making jokes this whole book. <laughs> there has to be some emotional, emotional depth. Car. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't want it. I was like, don't make don't me like do me. that. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, I don't like being serious. So the serious parts were really hard for me to like, especially because like, you know, I'd get myself in the head of Elliot and she's very like energetic person, even more so than I am. And so it was really hard for me to like, I would have to like literally say out loud. Cause this is like an ADHD thing. Sometimes I will like say out loud to myself. I'll be like, would focus. So I had to like say out loud. I'll be like, Elliot McHugh, focus, <laughs> like chill out. Like you're having an actual moment. So get serious mm -hmm. for, for, for once. Um, so those parts were definitely a lot harder than, than the jokiness. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you can well, tell, but I'm not a very serious person. So <laughs> I do know that about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, so you sent me an email with many suggestion questions. Although look at this tiny pen. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, 
And we, uh, you were asking if I wanted to talk about college. So I was wondering if you got along with your freshman year roommate. No, no. Well, I had two. So okay, I lived in a double, so just me and my roommate. But my freshman year roommate, first semester of college, we didn't know each other. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, who lived in the Boston area, like, matriculated from Boston high schools, like kind of roomed with people that they knew, but I did not. So I got a complete stranger. Um, this was pre-social media. So like we didn't connect before we moved in together at all. So I knew nothing about her and I got there and I'm kind of like, ah, a little bit loud. And I like to bounce around and she was very quiet, very calm. Um, and she was also an Irish dancer. And she would get up every morning at 6 a.m. to practice her Irish dancing. And she would turn on all the lights in the room at 6 a.m. every morning, turn on the lights, eat cereal out of a very noisy bowl, and then practice her Irish dancing at 6 a.m. because she had class at 8. And I, like, was losing my mind for the first semester. We basically didn't speak to each other for the entire first semester. And that sucked because I like totally got my ass dumped freshman year for like first semester. And I was like, I need to cry, but she's Irish dancing. <laughs> and I can't cry <laughs> while my roommate's Irish dancing. <laughs> but it's such a huge violation of like roommate etiquette to wake up at 6 a.m. and turn on the lights. Turn on the lights, all Are the lights. Are you kidding? All the lights. No. Yeah, it was so, I invested in some, noise canceling headphones and an eye mask. And I learned to sleep with like my, my arm like that. So I would block more light. Um, so it was, it was pretty bad. And I don't think she particularly liked that. I was a bit messy and all these, you know, I'm sure I'm a shitty roommate too. So, um, we ended up switching like roommates. So I ended up staying in the room, the same room, but she moved across the hall to her friend's room and then that her friend's roommate moved into my room who I'd also never really met or anything you so were like maybe this is better though so. and it was and it was and she was is still one of my closest friends and she was one of the inspirations oh, for Lucy and like she was an amazing person um Rebecca Lear I love you I'm shouting you out <laughs> Um, she's an, a fantastic human being. We became instant friends. So that was really what sparked the, um, you know, the, the Insta friendship with Lucy in, in fresh. <laughs> well, my freshman year roommate was very nice, but also cleared her throat a lot. <laughs> oh, that's once you hear that, like one time you can't ever unhear it. Oh, <laughs> that it would drive me crazy. Up. It drove me crazy. And I have like some misophonia. Um, and so like the sound of chewing and any mouth noises really bother me. So she just like made me like homicidal with rage. Oh and we were in Minnesota. This was at Carleton College. It's a tiny college in like a very cold area. And so it's not like I could leave. Like there wasn't anywhere to go. So right. yeah. I the, the roommate situation is is so tricky to navigate. It's so tricky. Like my spouse, his roommate, he always tells me that like they became instant best friends and they still are best friends like day one. And I'm like, God damn, like <laughs> I had to go through a whole semester <laughs> of like, yeah. and then start all over again the second semester. So some people just get really, really lucky, I think, you know, and it's lucky the draw, but yeah. I thought you went to Northwestern for some reason. I did, I did go to Northwestern. So I transferred after my- So you did year, leave. Which, you did yeah, leave. I left. <laughs> Um, so that's, if anyone is a teenager in this event, um, you can transfer. I almost left Emerson. I almost left. I applied to USC. I know saying that to an Emerson student is like, oh, gasp. Um, every Emerson kid who leaves either goes to USC or NYU. Um, oh, I almost okay. went to USC, but my dad came up because I was like not having a great time my freshman year. Elliot has a much more interesting time than I do <laughs> my freshman year, but I almost dropped out and my dad came up for a weekend and he was like, you can drop out if you want to, but you're going to have to start all over. He's like, or you could just stick it out and see if you want to like, if it gets better. And I was like, fine, I guess I'll stick it out. And then he was totally right. It got better. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. Freshman year is I don't know. It was it's hard. And I think what's, I think what's interesting about being a freshman, and this has come from reading reviews of fresh, um, 
And I hadn't even thought about this until I started reading Ruse enough. People have said the same thing where I was like, huh. <laughs> and it's that I think every freshman goes through like the exact same experience in terms of like not knowing what they're doing, being totally anxious and feeling like they're behind and feeling overwhelmed and all that stuff. But no, like freshmen don't seem to talk about it with each other because everybody wants to appear as though that they have their shit together and that they, mm. that they're enjoying their time away from home for the first time. And I, I wish more freshmen would like get together. Like, I wish I had talked to my roommates about this. Like even the Irish dancing roommate, I could have had that conversation with her, you know? Um, Cause like, obviously she wasn't doing Irish dancing. There's no dance team at Emerson. So you know, was she doing it because it reminded her of home and she was feeling homesick? Like, I don't know, you know, so. Well, she was doing it. She was doing it sure. every morning. I'm really good at impersonating. Well, I used to be really good at impersonating Michael Flatley, you know, doing the Irish dancing. <laughs> I used no. to, I used, I had like a whole routine where I would, I would try to pretend like I was Irish dancing. <laughs> I should bring that back. <laughs> you should. Gosh. Oh my God. You wrote true or false you wrote the first draft of divergent while you were still a college student yeah so um i came up with the idea my freshman year and i wrote like 30 pages but it was from tobias's perspective and it just didn't work so i put it away Four but still later, you had the idea you had the idea your freshman year so something about being a freshman <laughs> inspired well, I mean, divergent <laughs> Divergent has that quality, right? Like she goes into this completely new place and it's terrifying and the people there aren't that nice. So yep. it's like, <laughs> it's so, true. You know, it's like going to college. I don't know, on steroids it's, sort of. Oh man, I never really thought about it that way, but you're so true. It's so you true. heard it here first folks, Divergent and Fresh, very similar. <laughs> Fresh is a, is a queer retelling of Divergent set at Emerson College. <laughs> That is now the new pitch oh for it. Minus oh, well. all of the plot and themes and dystopian aspect. Yeah. Other than that, yeah. it's the exact same. <laughs> exact same book. <laughs> <laughs> well, no wonder you weren't partying. You were too busy coming up with the idea for your future bestseller. <laughs> I know, I guess. Yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't party and I got good grades. And you said in your email, you're like, if you got straight A's, did you have fun in college? And the answer is no. <laughs> no, I did not. I mean, it was fine. I did have fun in the like, I don't know. I like school, so for yeah. Me, I think that if you're a person, fun. yeah. I I think if you're a person who enjoys academia, like enjoys education, <laughs> you probably had a great time. But um, yeah, I actually like. I actually was more focused about my grades than um than I thought I would be by the time I got mostly because Emerson is so like concentrated um it kind of felt like i was going to a trade school uh there aren't very okay. many there weren't very many like they call them common core classes where it's you have to like take all those um to fill up your credits and stuff those were like always like the weird classes so there was like a buffy class um i took an 11 eroticism and western culture class which was really interesting because one of the girls that was in the class with me her father wrote men are from mars women are from venus so she had a lot to say in that class <laughs> she was very authoritative in that class and I found that really interesting also that class was pass fail so thank you Emerson um but uh all of the marketing classes like I really loved like I like hit my stride academically when I when I got to Emerson um but high school <laughs> I yeah was... but I mean you got yourself to you got yourself to Emerson that's oh that's because I auditioned and I originally went there for theater and then immediately switched to marketing <laughs> I did not oh have the grades to get I, into Emerson. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm learning a lot from you um, <laughs> right now, a lot about you. Yeah, um, I uh, my audition piece was like a Patti Smith monologue. Yeah, it was like a, it was a whole thing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I did some student films that, thank God, are not on YouTube anymore. <sighs> are you sure? Have you looked at them? Oh, I asked them to be taken down. <laughs> nice. Nice. Once I graduated, I was like, all right, you're going to have to take that down because I'm definitely topless in this student film. So please take it down. <laughs> uh, yeah, that should never be on YouTube. Come on, guys. Oh, classic, classic. <laughs> um, okay, we got some Qs in the oh, Q&A. I've got some A's for the yeah, Qs. So if you have Qs, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, someone has asked what your favorite movies are. Not comedy. 
actually. I don't no? like comedy Ooh. movies. Um, no, um, I prefer, I'm really, really into action movies. I love action movies. The, and it, the worse they are, the better, but I also love really good action movies. So uh, my favorite movie based on, and I'm basing this on the movie that I've seen the most number of times and I can quote the most is The Matrix, hence why it, there is a lot of Matrix references in Fresh, but The Matrix. I love The Matrix. Also the Wachowski sisters went to Emerson. So Emerson represent. <laughs> um they're, so from Matrix, chicago. they're from chicago oh there you go the midwest mw that's right <laughs> um so the matrix and then mad max fury road um i love action movies but yeah I, I prefer comedy tv shows but movies it's the matrix and mad max fury road and also everything that nicholas cage has ever been in um, oh god <laughs> don't say that <laughs> face off quality it is a Wanna quality take a movie off. Oh. Yeah, that movie's amazing. Um, so good. <laughs> I just watched it a couple of years ago and I was like, whoa, this is actually amazing. Like, this it's, is a good. It's so movie. bad. I mean, it's a John Woo movie, so it's great. You know, it has like the doves and everything. Like, it's and all the like, five person standoff where they're like, <sighs> oh, yeah. And they've got like, I, I love a good five person standoff. Like when they parody that in the office. So it's one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a big sci-fi movie person. So for me, it's, I mean, The Matrix is definitely one of my faves, but then Blade Runner and Children of Men. And I loved Ex Machina. And, oh my God, yeah. Ex Machina was so good. So good. That movie's so underrated. <laughs> I know, and so unsettling. It's like so quiet. It takes place just in one building really. And God, I love yeah. it. It was, it kind of like, oh God, I almost got really like into my Emerson, let's critique this film and how it relates to Jean-Paul Sartre's no exit, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> it's very, it's very Emerson. It's funny. Um, when I was in college, like this was still the iTunes era um, or the CD era, actually. So it's really funny that letter that I wrote to my little sister, one of the pieces of advice that I brought was like, don't bring too many CDs. <laughs> He's so like, funny. I won't, don't worry. <laughs> but in high school, people's CD collections were like a status symbol. But when I got to Emerson, it was people's movies, movie collections, like their DVD collection. So that was like how you could tell who was cool and not cool. Um, so I had to befriend a couple of film majors in order to get access to a lot of really good movies. Um, and it's cool because a lot of those kids are now actually working in Hollywood and working on some really cool films. So it's been fun to see them like, you know, freshman year to where they are now. <laughs> oh, this is why you asked me. You're like, do you know anyone famous from yes. you, that you went to college with? And I was like, what? No. <laughs> Wait, really? No. no one came out of your class that has become famous? Listen, are you, are you the most famous? You're the most famous then. Maybe. That's weird. But no, I knew like five people. So like really, <laughs> like the odds were not good <laughs> that I would know anyone. But You're no, saying, I don't think. Yeah. But Emerson yeah, churns out a lot. Of... Yeah, Emerson churns out a lot. Um, Harris Whittles, who I mentioned earlier, but um, also in my class was, um, who was served as one of three boys that I went to Emerson with who, every character in my book is sort of like the inspiration of multiple people. <laughs> um, but three guys I went to Emerson and inspired the Brad character in Fresh, um, the lovable himbo, love him. Um, and Matt McGorry is one of them. And he is on, um, uh, oh gosh, How to Get Away with Murder and um, Orange is the New Black. Like he's in a bunch of stuff now. Um, and so it's fun to see him get really famous. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so Yeah, weird. that's cool. Man, well, yeah. I, I mean, there's still time. Maybe someone I went to school with will become very No, I very think fancy. it's you, boo. I think it's you. <laughs> oh my God, they're probably like, ugh this girl and her YA books and her amazing um, novels oh okay we have you sort of answered the are all the characters in the book based on your college friends slash acquaintances we know that your uh Lucy was based on your roommate ba right? Lucy's based on three people <laughs> three people um yep. the dad is obviously my dad her sisters are my sisters so like anybody who's in her family is directly pulled from my family sorry family if you're offended but like it's i had to immortalize you That's all a dangerous in some game way. you're playing <laughs> 
they're all excited about it. They, I doubt yeah. any of them will actually read it all the way through. So <laughs> I would be surprised. Um, oh. The other characters in the book though are, other than Lucy and Brad, the other characters kind of are, they started off maybe based on some people that I know, but then kind of morphed into their own, you know, personalities. There are a handful of like random one-off characters that only get mentioned once that are just like nods to my friends. You know, I had to slip them in there. Um, and so, yeah, everybody in the book is sort of like a combo of someone that I know in my life um, or several people that I know in my life, but I can't say who legally. So, except for the family okay. people. Yep. <laughs> There's that whole disclaimer at the beginning. Just like, I know, any it's resemblance like, to real any people resemblance. is <laughs> incidental. <laughs> <laughs> um, except for the people who I've told you're in the book. Um, I think everybody, I, I mean, have you ever written any of your people in your life into your books? No, really? I don't really, no, I don't really do that. I, it's too stressful for me. I feel the need to like make them too close to the person that I know. And then I can't do that. So, um, and I, I have trouble like defining the line between accuracy and like imagination sort of. So, um, I just don't. I take little bits of myself, like little things that I identify with, and then I kind of like blow them up. So yeah. that's my strategy. I think I mostly used these people in my life for their, like their appearances, except for the family. Again, the family is very like almost some of the conversations were like, were just straight from texts that I've had with people, with my family members. Mm -hmm. Um, but like the other characters, I think they're, it's mostly like in their appearances and overall, like what drives them but like their day-to-day -day, like what they're into and stuff like that like those are very different <laughs> yeah um I, mean, I didn't know where to start because like again I didn't I didn't take a writing class at Emerson so um I did some method acting <laughs> and it method also writing. to like to have your book set in the real world like it's easier oh, yeah. to draw inspiration it's from true. real people <laughs> to me it's like okay take your friend from high school and make them an intergalactic warrior. <laughs> no. Veronica, <laughs> I give you permission to make me a villain in your next story, in your next oh. intergalactic. Oh my God, I'll I'm give a it a try. I'm a villain in um, Daniel Page's Snow Queen book. Um, she named her villain after me and apparently also the likeness. And I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, nice. Man, that's a dream. <laughs> I always tell people, I'm like, look, if you're going to write me in your book, that's great just make me the villain and I gotta be hot. That's all I care about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that seems reasonable to me. Um, <laughs> someone asked, uh, which characters from Fresh do you think would be friends with which characters from Divergent and Chosen Ones? <laughs> mm. Oh, I think Theo James, or Theo James, Four. <laughs> I think Four would be friends with Rose, the RA. Oh yeah. I, I mean, think they're both like in an authority role. Exactly. Yeah. Four is four is the RA of Dauntless. He is. Oh, he is the RA of Dauntless. So Rose and Four would be like co-RAs together. Mm -hmm. Um, I think no one would be friends with Sloan from Chosen Ones. She is no. mean. <laughs> I don't know that anybody would be friends with Elliot in the Divergent world because I think she'd be too jokey for what's happening. <laughs> Uriah would totally be friends. That's with true. Her. That's true. Yeah. Uriah. Yeah. Uriah would. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> they have, yeah. Good pal energy. Gosh. Um, all right. Question for both of us. How many drafts did it take for us to get to the final drafts of our first books? I think how many drafts? Like maybe seven or eight. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what do you count as a draft exactly? I count like, a draft as like, I had the whole thing written and I had to go back and basically rewrite all of it. Yeah, okay. So that would be about seven or eight, where I had more than 50,000 words that I had to go back and restructure or re-finagle. Um, yeah. And then a lot of just random drafts of scenes that never made it in. Um, what about with Divergent? Um, when I first wrote it, it was quite short. So it was like 50,000 words, mm -hmm. which is uh, over half of its current length. So I just kept adding to it when, when revising, because it, it would be like the note yeah. I would get is like, we need more of this or that. And then, so it, it just like doubled in size. So it's hard to count drafts because it's like, well, exactly it took like a year, <laughs> but 
I don't know how many drafts it was. It was a lot of drafts, I think. It's true. So. Like, fr- I think actually almost every single scene that was in that original before I knew it was going to be Emma thing, almost all of that is still in fresh. They just got moved around and who was actually in the scene got, you know, mixed up and changed. Um, but the scenes themselves were like the auction scene was one of the first scenes that I ever wrote and that um, that made it in. So like a lot of those scenes made it in. <laughs> oh um, my God, I'm still like dying inside from that scene. I so. actually did, I did get up at the auction and said, I'm not wearing any underwear and no one, no one wanted what I was selling. <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I was too forward. I was too forward. <laughs> We're like, I don't know what this date's going to be like. It's very intense. <laughs> oh, it was fun though. Honestly, like it was really cathartic to be able to take a lot of those awful freshman year memories and turn them into comedy for this book. Because that, when they happened yeah. to me, I was like, that sucked. That was a really hard day. And then now I've turned them into comedy and looking back, on, I have enough distance now where I can look back on and be like, all right, that was pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty cool that you have these stories because I, as the one who did nothing, um, I can tell you that I don't remember a lot because like I didn't take a lot of risks so you know there's a risk reward like yeah but look like what happened after you graduated you know like sure, yeah I mean you know I did things each, in my life just not then. Each their <laughs> own <laughs> yeah um oh along those lines do you have advice for incoming college freshmen yeah um don't bring a lot of stuff with you That is the one universal piece of advice that I think still applies, whether you're a freshman in the 1970s or a freshman now, is don't bring a lot of stuff with you when you're a freshman because you will accumulate so much shit. And then when you finish your freshman year, nine months later, you have to like get rid of it or sell it or move it back home. And it's a huge pain in the ass. And what always ends up happening is so much stuff just gets thrown out. Um, so I learned that my freshman year and sophomore year, I showed up with like nothing, like literally nothing. And it was so much better that way. Um, because you just, you just collect, you know, you get stuff from your friends and you go shopping and you buy stuff and it's just, you get a lot of stuff when you're there. So, um, definitely don't overpack (laughs) your freshman year, even though you're going to want to, because you want to nest you know, and like every yeah. freshman feels like they want to bring parts of their home with them. But like, I promise you, your dorm will start feeling like your home very, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So oh my God. Um, what's your is, advice? Mine is, uh, well, for people who are like me, <laughs> type, type A school types, um, my advice is don't pick classes based on what time they are or what they sound like. Try and ask people who the good professors are and just take their classes. It doesn't matter if you're like super interested in it. You just like a good teacher will make anything interesting. And that is the thing I didn't do. And I missed like after I left Northwestern, everyone would be like, oh man, did you ever take Gary Morrison's Russian lit class? And I was like, no, because it was at a bad time. (laughs) I did that too. I I missed out on a lot of good classes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I just like really wanted a, a, like a good schedule a lot of the time. And I convinced myself that anything I took would be fine, but I had a lot of bad professors. Sorry. Um, <laughs> not yeah, even, like, I... writing, but uh, in other subjects. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's actually really good advice. I should have put that in the book. I didn't, I didn't, even, I don't think I even mentioned professors once in my book. <laughs> well, that's okay. You can't talk about everything. Um, True. Somebody called it drunk academia in their review. And I was like, accurate hurtful, but accurate. <laughs> also, no one is going to follow this advice, but maybe consider not going to college with a boyfriend. Oh, never, never, never date somebody your freshman year, at least, at least your first semester. I did it. Or people like, you know, all my friends either like came to high school or came to college with their high school boyfriend. They all broke up. And, or like me and I got into a relationship of my first semester, got my ass dunked. And it was just like, don't do it. Just wait until after your first semester, people are going crazy. Like pe- yeah. things settle down by your second semester. So just hold off if you can, before you get into a, a serious relationship. <laughs> I held on to my high school boyfriend all the way through college. And there are oh. a lot of things that I didn't do. Didn't all the way through college? In. Yeah. Wait, so you never up. got some strange in college? Oh, 
I'm so, so sad for you. Go back, go I, get a graduate degree so you can do it all over again. I did make friends with my Except that you're husband. married now. Yeah, yeah, I made friends with him and we were friends for three years. And then uh, after I broke up with other guy. I tried to bang my hu- now husband. We met sophomore year at, at Emerson. I totally hit on him the first time I met him. And he was dating somebody at the time. That didn't really bother me <laughs> or stop me. But she did approach me and she was like, yo, you need to back off. And I was like, all right, respect. Uh, but I totally did try. <laughs> I'm glad we did it because we would not be together yeah. now. But <laughs> Oh, can I tell you my meet cute? Yes. So, okay, so we were friends for three years, but we did have a meet cute, which is that I was standing at the cereal dispensers and they're these big like things with like a tube at the bottom and they get mm-hmm. stuck. Um, and so I was like shaking it. And all the Fruit Loops came out all at once and just spilled all over the counter. And I turned around with my bowl, like ashamed. And he was standing behind me. And you've met Nelson, but yeah. Nelson is really cute um, and has really blue eyes. And I was just like, oh God. <laughs> I hope you turned to him and said, you're my lucky charm. <laughs> oh my God, that would have been great. But no, I was just like, sorry. <laughs> running into him and then we became friends and I was like oh my god, oh my god. I love college meet cute stories that's so good I also I love that your college had the cereal bar because I thought it was just Emerson so it's really oh, good. No, I'm glad cereal everywhere. Yeah. I've never eaten so much Captain Crunch with berries in my life Come I on. grew up the best. only eating like my parents would only have like um healthy like healthy cereal like wheat raisin bran yeah so when I got to college it was like oh Hell yeah, Fruit Loops, Frosted Flakes, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, like load it all up, suicide style, mix them all together. Like, <laughs> I would do that thing where you sneak it out of the dining hall and you just like <laughs> put it I in learned, the cup and then. I learned that freshman year. That was one of the things that was in my letter to my little sister that I did not include into Fresh, but I learned very quickly to invest in Tupperware. And I would go to the dining hall and load up Tupperware, hide it in my backpack and then take it out. So I didn't have to yeah. like pay for food when I got hungry at midnight. <laughs> Well, because who only eats three meals a day? Like, give me a break. Exactly. So <laughs> another piece of advice for college students, you know, steal stuff. Learn how to steal. Because uh, you're so- paying for it anyway. <laughs> it's true. When I moved off campus uh, my junior year, I would go back, obviously have all my classes back on campus. And my Emerson ID still get would get me into the little building, which is the dorm room. And um, but I was living in an apartment at the time. So I would just go into the little building and steal toilet paper from the little building. Cause I didn't want to pay for it in my apartment. So steal stuff. Totally you know? have done that. You know, yeah. just like one every now and then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or a lot. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, recent favorite reads is a question. Oh, um, okay. My reading taste. I don't typically read in the same genre that I write. Um, yeah. I don't know why I just don't, <laughs> I don't read a whole lot of contemporary. Um, so right now I'm in a um, like adult serial killer kick. Uh, so I just read this book called A Certain Hunger by Chelsea Summers. It's a standalone. Mm. It's about a lady food critic who is also a cannibal slash serial killer. It is like the female version of American Psycho, except so much better than American Psycho because American Psycho is so redundant and just like gets very old hat very fast. Um, But it was such a bizarre book and I read it in like two days. It was thoroughly entertaining. Definitely adult content, heads up. Obviously it's a cannibal. Um, (laughs) But the way that she described, you know, because she's also a food critic. So there's a lot of like, if you're really into food writing, you'll probably really enjoy this book. Um, But it's really, it was really good. Um, I'm trying to think like, I'm like looking around. What else have I I know I always forget the second that I'm done. But I I read, um, I read In the Quick by Kate Hope Day, which is a sci-fi. It's like a loose retelling of Jane Eyre, but I mean, it's all, it's very cool. Like it's uh, all about kind of astronauts and space and then also Jane Eyre things. There's Veronica, if you were going to do a Jane Austen retelling in space, which retelling, like which Jane Austen book would you uh, retell in space? I haven't read that much Jane Austen to be honest. So okay, what about a classic? Me. Which classic would you retell in space? Oh God. Um, well, I'm, hmm. This is a good question. Uh, Dracula um, in space. <laughs> no, so the reason I'm not answering is because I already did, and I just can't talk about it yet. <laughs> well, that's a good teaser then. Yay! Yeah. 
Yeah, so sometime <laughs> soon I'll talk about it. But yeah, that's, I so did, that's awesome. Yeah, I do love like, um, I don't know, I really liked ancient Greek stuff. Um, mm. And I took it, my best class in college was Revenge Tragedies. Uh, that's what it was called. And we read like The Crow and uh, and then like all the ones where they bake other people's children into pies, like Medea and- Oh um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like a whole subgenre. And we read Sweeney Todd and um, just like a whole bunch of, anyway, it was the best, it was so fun. It was that's like, so cool. So I love, I love a revenge story and haven't written one yet. Uh, uh, I want to write- One day. I don't know if it'll be the next book or at some point, but my favorite story, like, you know, there's like only seven stories out there, like story types out there. My favorite one in movies is the like Avengers Assemble, like Magnificent Seven, like gathering the team up to go defeat like, the foe. Oh, that like, ha- we need like, a wheelman. We need yes. a tech guy. Yeah, I yes. love that stuff. I am such a sucker for a like team assemble five mm-hmm. was a five man band i think that's what the like the trope is called five man band um yeah. i love that and so part of me is like oh i would love to write like a comedy version of that like maybe a fantasy like mel brooks style fantasy or western oh. or something i don't know but that's i love that sort of story structure I mean, definitely need more like comedic fantasy and sci-fi there is a plenty yes. but I always want more and I'm not the one to do it so I'm like please do it I want <laughs> it but it's, I don't have it's funny because like I was doing a little bit of research into that recently because I was like you know I love the show Gallivant you know gone too soon that show was amazing I grew up on Mel Brooks like literally I was trained on Mel Brooks um Robin so Hood, I love Men in Tights yeah Men in Tights is History of the World Part One. Oh my God, everything yeah. that Mel Brooks does. Spaceballs, like all of it. It's so good. Um, and I was looking into like, there are a handful of like fantasy comedy writers. Christopher Moore is one of them, the Lamb Gospel yeah. According to Biff. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide. Hitchhiker's Guide. And it's all dominated by men. It's all men. I could not find mm-hmm. one fantasy comedy or sci-fi comedy that was like like a parody style that was written by a woman. And I was like, why? Not- and, and I- it brought me back to this comedy class that I took at Emerson and was like, people don't find women funny. (laughs) Damn it. You're going to find me funny. Shit. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you are funny. It's not, it's not technically like a comedy, but have you read Gideon the ninth? Yes. Gideon the ninth. (laughs) Gideon the ninth. To be honest, it took me a while to get into. Uh, There was a hurdle. Yeah. (laughs) There was a hurdle, but once I got into it, Gideon the ninth is probably the most recent fantasy that I've read that was actually funny um yeah. really funny like Kristen Kirsten White paranormal it's like an old YA book oh, that book is yeah. funny I that book that is book. really funny mm. yeah so I don't know who knows maybe I don't know I'm having I'm having fun because Fresh is now out so like literally even as of yesterday I was like starting I was like okay cool the book's out now I can start thinking of like what I'm gonna do next because I can only do I'm not you know I got a day job so I have yeah. a very limited amount of time to be writing so I only just now started recently thinking about it but I'm I'm very excited by the idea of playing around like because Fresh plays around with structure and all that stuff and mm-hmm. it would be really fun to turn some fantasy on its head but who knows I would love that um <laughs> One of my recent reads, I can't also can't talk about because it's my friend's new book, but I will talk about her other books, which is Maureen Goo. So if you like funny contemporary uh, romance, that are right there, Maureen. Stuff, yeah, God, she's so great. Um, if you love K-pop really, really comedies, funny. if you love K-pop dramas, check out Maureen Goo's stuff. Um, amazing, and it's also about to be a movie or a show or something. I know she's just got multiple things optioned on Netflix, and I'm pretty pumped for her. Yes, I know. <laughs> God, I love seeing my author friends succeed. <laughs> I know, so nice. Good to see. Um, I mean, I think we could probably do one more cue and then we gotta- Then we gotta the wrap it up. Sounds good. Um, oh, who who are your literary heroes? Oh, um, Patti Smith. Patti Smith, like the singer, but also the author. <laughs> um, Just Kids is the probably the one book that I have re- reread the most uh, because every time I reread that book, it reminds me why I'm trying to do this. Like why I'm trying to be an author or like be a professional writer full-time. And because being a writer is 
for those of you who are not published yet, it's a lot of work, a lot of work. And it doesn't always lead to sales, you know, like there are so many amazing books out there that just nobody, no audience has ever discovered them. I mean, yeah. So it's a lot, it's a, you have to do it. It's a labor of love, you know, it's like making, um, like a ha, huh, you know, it's like, it takes so much work <laughs> for like one little thing. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to remember why you want to, why we're doing this, why we've chosen this path in our lives. And that book always without fail will remind me of why I've chosen that path. Um, so for me, Patty Smith is my literary hero. Uh, she, the last thing I did in New York, like literally the night before I left New York after living there for a decade was she had a new book out called devotion. It's a collection of like little poems. And she was giving a talk at a church in Brooklyn and I'm not a religious person, but that was the closest I ever came to like having a religious experience was listening to Patti Smith talk about this book, play music and sing in a church in New York. And it was just like, wow, oh, it was amazing. It was so amazing. So for me, Patti Smith, well, I will, I love her and she's very, very inspiring. Even though we have extremely different styles, I, I find her, she's, she's my hero. <laughs> uh, mine is recently i just i don't know uh, so i've liked george saunders for a long time he's very funny too so mm -hmm. um but i went to a talk of his a virtual one with his like new book release and i'd never seen him before i didn't know anything about him um and he was just like an exceedingly gentle kind man with like deep deep empathy and he was talking about writing and about eliminating dishonesty from your writing about how like trying to preach through your writing is a form of dishonesty and I was just like ah! like everything you're saying made me feel like okay like I know how to do this job and it's to be more like that yes. um, and nothing else matters like the way that things perform or the weird moment when they come out because you know chosen ones came out at like the worst possible time last <laughs> year it's terrible um, but anyway it was like none of that matters because you're committed to like the craft of writing and the meaning that it has um and watching him made me like I mean I was sitting there weeping at this zoom in like December anyway I so, hope I hope that video is online somewhere because I would really love to watch that <laughs> I will look for it and then send it to you if I sweet find it. sweet but have you read yeah. just kids if you haven't read just kids I will send you a copy <laughs> no, I, I have like five copies I will send you one <laughs> thank you all right I guess we're wrapping up yeah, before we wrap up, I have book recommendations for you, Margot, because I was screaming when you were talking. Um, Tell me. If you want rompy sci-fi by women, um, yes. Chilling Effect by Valerie Valdez, if you haven't read that. I'm writing this Very, down. I know, I'm Barry like- Barry Douglas gonna... Adams, uh, a woman ascend, uh, assembles a ragtag crew to save her kidnapped sister. There are like psychic cats a la like Saga, if you've ever read that graphic novel. Love um, Saga. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so chilling effect. I think book two is out or on its way out. Um, okay. And then if you haven't read How Rory Thorne Destroyed the Multiverse by Kay Eason. I uh, had that on my, it's on my Kindle. <laughs> it's like the princess bride space romp sort of thing. It's a duology and it's finished. So. All right. Very cute. And then. <laughs> I'm writing it all down. Another one. <laughs> Since you love an, a, a team assembling, um, it's not out yet. I think it comes out in September. It's called The All-Consuming All World by Cassandra Kaw. Uh, Westworld meets Dirty Dozen with queer women of color. The main character, uh, her like consciousness keeps being reborn into AIs every time she dies. And she's just like sick of it. So she like assembles a team of other like queer women to like dismantle. Oh my oh god, that reminds me of like the mate. That's like a comedy yeah. <laughs> matrix western. So those oh, three books, I would. Recommend. I mean, guys, I just want to say this is why you befriend your local bookseller. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's so, so true. I, those are the three that I would recommend. Uh, but one is out, I think. But all of them are out except for All Consuming World, which is out like next month. Oh my god, I have access to Edelweiss. You better believe the yeah. first thing yeah. I'm doing is going <laughs> <laughs> to <of> that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, authors, for like when I my brain turned to motion left my body and I forgot your intros. Like I did a store <laughs> no worries for this and commuted an hour and a half home. So oh, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you so much, um, and I appreciate everyone who attended. If you haven't bought copies 
of Fresh, or if you want copies of Veronica's books, we have all of them in stock at our store. I put a link in the chat where you can order them online. We ship through the US. And we do have autographed copies of Fresh at the store. So if you want a signed copy, we have plenty. Um, it's beautiful. I, I held it in my hands today. Um, so I hope you all get oh, They look that pretty. One. They look so pretty next to each other. <laughs> they do. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so thank you to Margo and thank you to Veronica. If any of you came in late, don't worry. We re usually record these events and they'll be up on our YouTube channel, which is just Belmont Books. And it's usually up within 48 hours or so. So you can kind of catch up on everything you missed. Um, follow Margo and Veronica around to their other events. Sounds like they've got some great stuff coming up. So thank you. Thank all. you, Veronica. Thank, thank you, you Belmont. Thanks for having us. <laughs> thank you, everybody who watched. Thank you. <laughs>